Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. I want to welcome all of you this morning. Uh, great to be with you on the Lord's Day. I know we have some visitors. We welcome you to uh, and pray that, that your time with us will be a, a blessing uh, to you. Hope that you'll come back and be with us again. And we have uh, many live streaming. We welcome all of our live streamers uh, as well. Uh, we have announcements. Seth is not here, lest you think that we really did fire him. <laughs> uh, Completely uh, prov providential. I know I made a smart aleck comment last week about Seth. They're out of town, so back to the B team. But uh, we do have a few announcements. We've got a full slate of activities uh, Tuesday and Thursday morning, women's, Bible, uh, women's prayer meetings. Tuesday morning, the women's Bible study that, uh, Bible study that Jeff is uh, teaching, the Epistle to the Hebrews. Uh, Wednesday night, the various classes are meeting peculiar, peculiar people, uh, the youth midweek recharge, and, and footsteps of, of faith. Um, keep in mind uh, Marie Anderson, meaning keep her in your prayers, it was in the bulletin. She had a minor stroke, and uh, she's a beloved member, so let's remember Marie. Did I forget anything? <laughs> yeah, I did. I'm, I'm out of practice. So now Dan, <laughs> very glad to have Dan back. And uh, Dan will come now and read our scripture passage for this morning. That's right, I forgot I wasn't here last week. So <laughs> thank you, Jeff. I... No, thank you, Mark. <laughs> I am out of practice. Well, one thing I know is we're starting a new book this morning. We are, we've been in the Psalms for a bit. As I said, I like to do that between uh, series, and so we're now at the series, and that's the book of Joshua. It's the sixth book of the Bible, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. And we are going to look at the first chapter, Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. And I'll read it. I'm going to read the entire chapter. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law, he may refer to the five books of the law that Moses wrote, but I think it's probably a reference to the book of Deuteronomy, which was to be read, read by the king later when they would have kings. He was to write it down and he was to read it. I think that's probably what's referred to here. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night 
so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourself, for within three days you are to cross this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess it. To the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God gives you rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But you shall cross before your brothers in battle array, all your, all your valiant warriors, and shall help them until the Lord gives your brothers rest he, as he gives you. And they also possess the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to your own land and possess that which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. Referring to the lands east of the Jordan that they conquered first, and uh, they were given that possession. We'll talk about that more when we come to it. They answered Joshua saying, All that you have commanded us we will do, and wherever you send us we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your command and does not obey your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. So there they repeat the Lord's words to Joshua. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time together in it. Let's bow together in prayer. In the year 426, after long and faithful ministry, Augustine stepped down as bishop in North Africa. His successor was a little-known man named Heraclius. At his first sermon, with Augustine seated on a throne behind him, Heraclius began, The cricket chirps, the swan is silent. It's a clever compliment, but one that probably let slip a feeling of inadequacy. One of... Who can fill his shoes? And how could he not wonder that? Augustine was a towering figure of history, even in his own day. Not as towering, however, as Moses. What must have Joshua felt when his time came to succeed his mentor and father in the faith, the lawgiver himself? That's how the book of Joshua begins. Moses is dead, and the Lord commands Joshua to lead the nation across the Jordan River and into the Promised Land. Three times in verses 6 through 9, we read God's command, be strong and courageous, or strong and stout. In verse 9, the Lord added, do not tremble, which might suggest some fear in Joshua. But it's not as though Joshua had not been properly groomed for the position. He had been. In verse 1, the Lord calls him Joshua ben Nun, or Joshua the son of Nun, Moses' servant. He was attached to Moses from the beginning. First as general of the army of Israel, then as Moses' aide de camp. His first appearance is in Exodus 17, verse 9, when he led the army of Israel in a battle against the Amalekites. Originally, his name was Hosea, which means salvation. 
But Moses changed it to Joshua or Yahshua, which means the Lord is salvation. He learned the significance of his name in that first battle where he showed himself to be a great warrior. Exodus 17, 13 states, Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. But he did it in the power of the Lord. It was in that battle that Moses stood on a hill overlooking the field and he raised his staff, the same staff that he raised when he divided the Red Sea. As long as the staff was raised, Israel prevailed. When Moses' arms got tired and lowered the staff, Israel failed. So to keep his arms from falling, Moses sat on a rock while Aaron and Hur supported them till the battle was over. Everyone saw it. It happened as a sign that victory is the Lord's, not man's. God's people win by heaven's might, not their own. And Joshua learned the lesson well. Joshua was chosen as one of the 12 spies that scouted the land of Canaan. He was the representative of the tribe of Ephraim. He and Caleb returned with a good report. Ten spies gave a bad report. The people followed the faithless spies. And the result was Israel did not enter the land, but wandered it, wandered in the desert for 38 more years. Those were years that were lived in a very hard place. But they gave Joshua a good education. As Moses' servant, Joshua accompanied, accompanied Moses everywhere. When Moses would go to the tent of meeting to speak to the Lord, Joshua was there where the Lord spoke to Moses face to face. Now that description of speaking to him face to face set Moses apart from all the prophets and people. The Lord spoke to him face to face. Moses, the Lord knew Moses, he said, as a friend. That was the Lord's description of Moses, his friend. And Joshua was there. He saw this. But he, what he also saw was the modesty of Moses. As great a privilege as Moses had, as great a man as, Joseph, as Moses was, he was called the humblest man on the face of the earth. One event that, that must have made a deep impression on Joshua is recorded in Numbers 11. Seventy elders were gathered around the, the tent of meeting outside the camp. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon them and they began to prophesy. But there were two men who remained in the camp. They were separated from this group, Eldad and Medad. And the Spirit came on them also and they prophesied as well, and Joshua learned of it, and it offended him, it angered him. They were not a part of this group, they were not associated directly with Moses, and he thought that was wrong, and an offense to his mentor. And so he told Moses about it, and he asked him to put a stop to it. But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets. In other words, it's not about me. I'm just a servant of the Lord, serving His people. I want them blessed even if it means I'm diminished. Joshua was a loyal, a loyal man, and that is good. But by Moses' example, he learned the virtue of meekness, of humility and selflessness that glorifies God before personal honor. He learned true leadership that it rejects self-aggrandizement and it seeks the elevation of others over self. Now that is unusual and that is hard, but that is leadership. George Whitfield was like that. He was the great preacher of the Great Awakening in the 1740s. Crowds of tens of thousands would attend his outdoor meetings in Britain and America. One historian wrote that Whitfield was arguably the most famous person in Britain and America, or at least 
the most famous person not named King George. When his friends wanted him to form a denomination with himself as the head, Whitfield said, let the name of Whitfield perish, but Christ be glorified. That was Moses. And Joshua learned from his example, and certainly from their many conversations, he, he learned a lot. He learned war. He learned trust. He learned humility. He was prepared. He was well prepared for the position to which God had called him. Still, when the Lord spoke to him in verse 2, it, it, it must have been a sobering moment for Joshua as he considered his new responsibilities, a moment that uh, tested his faith and courage. Verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Now that indicates the importance of this book. It is a bridge between the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, and the rest of Scripture. The, the promise given then will now be fulfilled. Without the book of Joshua, there, there would be a gap in the history of Israel. So this is a very significant book. And in a practical sense, this is a very significant moment because what was promised then is now about to be fulfilled, showing that God keeps His Word. But consider, considering this command in verse 2, how does a person, regardless of his training, and as I said, this man, Joshua, was well prepared. Still, how does he fill the shoes of such a man as Moses? Anyone who thinks that, that, that he can and is eager to do it probably really isn't ready or prepared for that. Still, the mantle of Moses had fallen to Joshua and it must have weighed heavy on his heart. He had lived in the shadow of the greatest man of his age and was now succeeding him. But not only that, his mission, the mission given to him was huge in and of itself. Verse 3, Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you just as I spoke to Moses from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. This is what God had promised Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 24. It's what He had promised to Abraham. In Genesis 15, verse 18, it's the promise of a large domain covering all of what is today modern Israel and well beyond that. The boundaries are from the Mediterranean Sea in the west to the river Euphrates in the east. It includes portions of modern Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Iraq. And it was never fully acquired. Even in the time of David and Solomon, when the kingdom reached its fullest extent, the outlying districts were within Israel's possession and influence, but never completely or permanent under their rule. So to this day, God's promise to Abraham and Joshua awaits fulfillment. And that will only happen when the Lord returns to establish His kingdom on earth. It was a vast region promised to Israel and a daunting task given to Joshua. But in it, the Lord gave him encouragement. In addition to his command that Joshua lead the people into Canaan was the statement that he was giving all of the land to them. Well, really, that says it all, doesn't it? I'm giving all of the land to you. It wasn't an empty promise. God's Word is absolutely reliable. It's absolutely reliable because He is reliable. And He's reliable because He's absolutely sovereign. Nothing can frustrate the Lord God. 
in verse 1, it is the Lord who spoke to Joshua. The word Lord, Jehovah or Yahweh, is his name. and It's his personal name. At the burning bush, he revealed the meaning of it to Moses. I am who I am. And that means he is the eternal God without beginning, without end. He is the I am, the uncreated, self-existent, self-sufficient God. The bush itself illustrated the nature of God and who he is. The flame was in the bush, but the bush was not consumed. That's the curious thing that drew Moses to it. He came to look at this bush, this unusual event of a bush burning without the bush being consumed. But that was the point. That's the illustration. The fire was self-sufficient. It didn't need fuel from the bush. That's a picture of God. We are His creation. He's not dependent upon us or anything in this great universe in which we live. He is sovereign, He's self-existent, infinite, and invincible, so His promises cannot fail. They're not dependent on anything but Himself. And He's all-powerful. And really, that's enough. Go forward, I'm giving it to you. That says it all. But He doesn't stop there. In verse 5, He added to that promise a personal pledge to reinforce to Joshua the certainty of victory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Now that shows who the actual leader of Israel and the general of its army was. It's the Lord God. What, what greater encouragement can there be than that? It's the encouragement the author of Hebrews gives us in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10, where he calls Christ the author of our salvation. That word author means leader. And it can be translated captain or pioneer. It's been translated that way. And the picture that that gives is the Lord leading us through this world to the promised land of heaven. We are absolutely secure. We have an infallible leader. And that's the assurance Joshua was given here. Success was certain. And he was well equipped as nobody in Israel was, to lead the people into their inheritance. He was well trained, and he was a man of faith. He'd proven that when he scouted Canaan 38 years earlier, and along with Caleb gave the, the good report that contradicted the, the, face, the faithless report of the ten spies. They... Joshua and Caleb knew that the land had been fortified with cities with tall walls and it was populated with giants. They knew all of that. But they said, if the Lord is pleased with us, then He will bring us into the land. The Lord won't fail us. Joshua had great faith. And he was spiritually armed. In Numbers 27, verse 18, the Lord described him as a man in whom is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And Moses, because of that, was to lay his hands upon him to be his successor. Now that's what we should look for in a person to teach us and to lead us as an elder or deacon, one who lives by faith and walks by the Spirit. That was Joshua. He believed the Lord. He was a man of God. And yet, even as a man of God, really, perhaps because he was a man of God, he had concerns. His faith was tested. That's suggested in the, the next two verses where the Lord says, Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them, only be strong and very courageous. And he repeats that in verse 9. Evidently, Joshua, this, this great and godly man, 
needed to have this council repeated and reinforced because there were lots of reasons for him to be weak and cowardly. And he knew his inadequacies. The giants and fortresses out there, the long months and years of fighting that lay ahead, the, the greatness of Moses that would invite comparisons and criticism, the high standard that he had to meet. Those were all obstacles to success that could get even great men of faith to, to worry and doubt. Who is sufficient for these things? That's the question that may have been on his mind. I suspect that it very much was. It's the question that Paul asked in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. Then he gave the answer a few verses later. Who is sufficient for these things? Our sufficiency is from God. And God is more than sufficient for all of our needs and our every situation. That's the basis of the Lord's counsel. The basis of the Lord's encouragement. It's based on everything he has just said. He wasn't giving worldly counsel. He's not saying, dig deep, find some courage, be a man. Joshua's courage was based on God's sovereignty. He controls people and events. He ordains the end, and he cannot be frustrated through the process. And best of all, He's with us and He will never forsake us. That's who the Lord is. That's what He does and that is what guarantees success. Not personal gift or strength or genius. The Lord gives all of that and the Lord gives it to be used and He uses all of that. But our confidence is not in that. It's not in ourselves. Our confidence is in the Lord. And in that confidence... He, Joshua, was to go out in faith and with courage. But faith is always guided by an objective standard. And I really want to underline that point. We, we have a path to follow. It's not our intuition. It's not our feelings. It's not a desire that we have. And if we just believe hard enough, God will bless it. It's not that at all. Our Standard, our object of faith, that which we follow is the Word of God. That's what the Lord said next when He told Joshua to obey the Scriptures. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth that you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Take strength and courage to do that, to be obedient to God's word because the way of the world often seems to make sense. It offers a quick fix very often. There's pressure to follow the way of the world. But we're not to do that. We're not to turn from the Word of God. We're to trust the Lord. We're to walk by faith. And He will always prove faithful. In fact, His Word is the source of strength and courage. It's life-giving. That's... Romans 10, verse 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of Christ. Do you want strong faith? I know I say this often. I often ask that question. But do you want strong faith? Meditate in the Word of God day and night. Joshua had been, has been called a prototype of the happy man of Psalm 1, or the original pattern of that man. And in that psalm, you know, he meditates on God's law day and night. And as a result, he's like a tree firmly planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. That's, that's a tree that weathers the ravages of drought. And it does so not because it's actually strong in and of itself, but because its source of water never runs out. 
It's planted by streams of water. And the student of Scripture is like that. He or she is stable in all situations and productive. Biblical meditation is a, an active mental process. In Psalm 63, 63, verse 6, David wrote of remembering the Lord and meditating on Him. So it's calling to mind the Lord and His Word. It's thinking on that. Biblical meditation is an, an active mental process. It involves two things. Remembering the Lord and His Word and, and talking about it to oneself. And, and the idea may be talking out loud. This word is used of making a sound or speaking. Some have translated this murmuring. Uh, centuries ago, people normally read out loud. I'm talking about 1,500 years ago or so. In his confessions, Augustine mentions seeing Ambrose. He and a friend visited Ambrose in his home. And they came, and there was Ambrose sitting in a room he was the great preacher of that day in the city of Milan. And what they saw surprised them because Ambrose was reading the Scriptures. He was meditating on the Scriptures. It said his, his eyes were moving, but his mouth was closed. He was reading silently. And that was very unusual because at that time, most people read out loud. And they did that perhaps because that helps a person's concentration to read out loud. And that seems to be the suggestion here. I don't think the lesson we're to take from that is to meditate. You need to read and think out loud. But what that shows is that meditation involves communicating with ourselves over Scripture. It involves speaking to ourselves. It involves thinking about who God is and what He has said and what He has revealed. And here, Joshua would be strong and courageous and successful wherever he went, when he was in the most difficult of times, regardless of those circumstances, as long as he meditated on God's law and obeyed it, as long as he followed it. There'd be no victory over enemies and no prosperity of the land apart from that. The record of Joshua's life is that he did that. And so he succeeded. Joshua's generation was faithful, but the next generation was not, and they provide a very clear foil to what we see here in Joshua, because it abandoned the counsel of the Lord. It abandoned the Word of God. It turned aside, as God told Joshua not to do. In the book of Judges, we read this refrain toward the end of the book, Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That explains the book, of Josh, uh, the book of Judges and what happened. They followed their own counsel and they rejected the objective revelation of God and conformed to the world with disastrous results. They were overcome by enemies and they lost their freedom. It was a cycle all through the book of Judges. And it will be no different for us. The people of God can only prosper as they know and believe God's Word and obey it. There's simply no other way. The Scriptures are absolutely sufficient. There's no substitute. That doesn't mean that if we follow the Word of God, there'll never be setbacks in our lives as, as men count setbacks. I would say, in a sense, there are no setbacks in that everything is worked out in the providence of God for our good, even though there are difficulties. But that is the point. There will be difficulties. Our life will not be filled with health and wealth. That's a myth. Righteous Job didn't have health and wealth all of his life. David the psalmist, the sweet singer of Israel, the man after God's own heart had trouble. Apostles were beaten, jailed, and killed. In the world you have tribulation, Jesus said. But even then, even then, we can have success in life by being faithful 
to the Word of God and thereby being fruitful and glorifying God. And that's our chief end. That's a successful life, a life that brings glory to God and is faithful. God will bless that life. And usually that kind of life is a peaceful life. It's a prosperous life, an orderly life that brings blessing. But we must be people of the book. We must be people who meditate in it routinely, soak ourselves in Scripture. That was the Lord's instruction to Joshua. So along with the, the clear statement of the sovereignty of God, there is the principle of our responsibility. The responsibility of man. God has made promises. He's good for those promises. He never fails. But Joshua and his people must obey. They had to obey. And to impress that on Joshua's mind, the Lord for a third time repeats his good counsel. Verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Well, now it's time to prepare for war. So encouraged by the Lord and armed with his promises, Joshua acted wisely and decisively. He commanded his officers to pass through the camp and tell the people, prepare provisions for yourself, for within three days you are to cross the Jordan. Napoleon said an army marches on its stomach. It relies on a good diet. And that's true of Israel's army. In, in order to do God's will and obtain their inheritance, they had to make preparations for their material, their physical needs. It's another example of people being responsible to achieve God's purpose. But... Some of the tribes had already obtained their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan. What would they do? That's recorded in Numbers 32 and Deuteronomy 3, where the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh had asked for their inheritance in the already conquered lands of Gilead and Bashan. And Moses consented to that on condition that when the time came, they would cross the Jordan with the other tribes and assist them in conquering Canaan. And they all agreed to do that. Well, now the time had come to honor their vow. And Joseph, uh, J Joshua reminded them of that and exhorted them to leave their wives and their children, their, their herds behind until the campaign was finished. Verse 14. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you beyond the Jordan, but you shall cross before your brothers in battle array. That means fully armed, at least in modern Hebrew, that's the way, that's the expression that's used of being armed. So with all of your arms, all your valiant warriors, and shall help them. Until the Lord gives, you, gives your brothers rest as he gives you. And they also possess the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to your own land and possess that which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. The nation had to be united. The tribes had responsibilities to one another. There could be no rest until all enjoyed that rest, and that inheritance together. And the three tribes agreed. In fact, they agreed with enthusiasm. They even threatened death to those who disobeyed. Verse 16, they, they answered Joshua saying, all that you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses Anyone who rebels against your command and does not obey your words and all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. It picked up on the Lord's command to Joshua. Obey his word. Don't turn from it. Be strong and courageous, Joshua. 
But what a contrast to that previous generation that rebelled. This one acted with faith and under the conviction of God's power and His promises. There's an exhortation to us here about unity. Jesus prayed about that in John 17. Keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. The apostles taught unity. The church is a body, a building, a flock, a unit, and we function effectively only when we function together like an army on the march with a common goal. It's hard to maintain unity. We can only do that by looking to Christ. He is faithful and He provides. We are to trust Him and follow His guidance, follow the guidance that He gives in Scripture, just as Joshua was to do. Christ is our real leader. He is the great shepherd of the sheep. He's the captain of our salvation. Gifted men come and go. They, they are a blessing to the church, but we're not dependent on them. Charles Wesley said, God buries His workmen, but carries on His work. He wasn't dependent on Moses or Joshua or Peter or Paul or Augustine and Luther. Christ builds His church. But in doing that, we get to be His workmen in that task. And there's no greater privilege in life than to be God's workman, to be what Moses was, the servant of the Lord. If you want success in life, and I mean success as the Bible counts success, which is eternal success, which is not the accumulation of power and possessions, but it is the things that please God and bring glory to Him. He honors that. If you want that, then follow the formula of Joshua 1, 6-9. Meditate on the Scriptures day and night. Believe them and practice them. Pursue the holiness of God and His glory, not your own. Follow Him with courage and conviction, and He will bless. That's the promise of Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You won't want for any good thing, and you will become a complete person. That's the good life. That's the greatest life. It's a meaningful life. None of us is sufficient for these things. We need to understand that. Understand that, that we are weak in and of ourselves, but the Lord is not. He is sufficient. We will be strong and courageous as we look to Him as we study His Word, fellowship with Him in prayer, and walk by faith in spite of the circumstances that will try to turn us aside to the right or the left, that will make us a Joshua in our generation. Joshua is a great name. It has a great meaning. The Lord is salvation. In Greek, as you probably know, Joshua is Jesus, and he, Jesus, is the greater Joshua and the fulfillment of all that Joshua ben Nun, Joshua the son of Nun, pictured. He brought Israel into the promised land. Jesus, the Son of God, has brought his people into the eternal promised land of the kingdom to come. Every believer, even now, is a citizen of heaven. It shows the certainty of our entering into it. Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? He died in the place of sinners. Experienced the judgment of sin on their behalf so that everyone who believes in Him will escape the judgment to come and have life, eternal life. If you've not looked to Him, if you've not trusted in Him, come to Christ, believe in Him, have forgiveness and eternal life, then with strength and courage, follow Him, 
the divine leader, the captain of our salvation as he leads us on to eternal victory and glory. May God help you to do that and help all of us to learn the lessons that he gave to Joshua. Let's pray. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Is there any greater comfort to be found than in those words? And as many has, have speculated, there's perhaps no better description of what hell is like than the Lord's abandonment of a soul there. When he was suffering on the cross, uh, the Lord Jesus felt intense physical pain. He had been beaten and scourged, abused, and mocked, and had a crown of thorns forcibly placed on his head. And then there was the agonizing, slow death that crucifixion inflicted upon its victim. But the greatest agony, the one that led him the previous night to labor in prayer, asking that if there was any way his cup of suffering might pass him by, was the agony of suffering God's righteous wrath on behalf of the sinners he had come to save and bring into the family of God and the kingdom of God. That's how Dan closed uh, his message this morning. If the truth of God's presence with us is the greatest joy and comfort, his holy judgment against sin that caused his son to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is surely the greatest cry of dereliction and sorrow ever uttered. As we come now to the Lord's table, we remember that. Uh, we remember uh, the sacrifice that he endured on our behalf. This bread and this cup uh, are intended to be reminders of that. When he established the supper, that's what he was telling his disciples and telling us this morning. He took that bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body. Uh, this, is, this bread symbolizes my body. Uh, broken for you, sacrifice for you, on behalf of you, I take this wrath from God and give you my righteousness. He took the cup. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Uh, there was blood shed. Uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins, and the Lord Jesus shed his own blood so that we might have forgiveness and enjoy a new covenant not based on the, as it turned out, impossible task of keeping the law, uh, but no, uh, our salvation is secured by our Lord's obedience and the sacrifice that he made. So let me give thanks now for uh, the bread, remembering as we partake that we're to remember him. That's what he said, do this in remembrance of me. Father, thank you for this time of remembrance. Uh, it is a weekly uh, delight uh, for us to be able to focus our minds uh, for this brief period on the uh, mission of salvation that you, uh, that our tribe embarked upon our behalf and our salvation came at a cost, a precious cost. And we give you thanks for your son who was obedient, obedient to that mission, obedient uh, to death. We thank you for the Lord Jesus and salvation that is ours because of him. In his name we pray. Amen. I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 and make a few comments. And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That principle of forgiveness through blood is not just New Testament doctrine. 
found throughout the Bible, as the author of Hebrews wrote, it's, it's from the law, especially, specifically, from, he, from Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11, where God told Israel, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. Forgiveness only through the shedding of blood is as much a part of the Old Testament as it is the New. In fact, we could say it goes back all the way to Genesis chapter 3, where the first, the first death occurred, and that's recorded there. God clothed Adam and Eve, he clothed their nakedness only by slaying animals. A vivid lesson, one that must have shocked them, that their guilt and, and, and nakedness could only be remedied by shedding blood. Sin is so serious that it, it requires death as its penalty. And only by a substitute can the guilty survive the necessary payment of that penalty. And that's the reason Christ came into the world. Why the Son of God became the Son of Man to suffer death in our place. And because He did, we who have believed in Him live forever. That's what we're to remember at this moment as we take the cup and we drink the wine. May God help us to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the great penalty that Your Son suffered in our place. And Lord Jesus, we thank You for coming to die in our place. Thank you for shedding blood for us, the undeserving. We thank you for the cross. It's the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Let me close with a benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen. Hope you all have a great week. Keep looking to Christ, the author and perfecter of faith.